Good evening. Well, it's been another fascinating day in the Catholic world. So I thought I'd come to you um, with a quick rundown of all the various things that are going on. Um, I've certainly got a project in the wind at the moment trying to uh, write something on one of these stories. Pope Francis has made some extraordinary remarks about Marxism, which sort of flies in the face of um, the previous 10 papacies. Uh, but there's lots of other stuff going on. And I thought one of the most interesting bits that I wanted to share with you with the most insights was from the pillar. Um, but first of all, I thought I'd just run through all the stuff that's going on. And probably the best way of doing that is uh, looking at Ed Pentin's timeline here on X or Twitter. Um, yesterday was the anniversary of Cardinal Pell's death, sad death. He was a great loss to the church, I think. Um, a real hero and a stalwart and a cardinal that I had the great pleasure of meeting a few years ago and actually having a pint with. Um, and he was a real man's man. You know, he was someone that I really got on with, um, I found very easy to get on with. And Ed Penton here has got this really interesting little memoir that he's put on his Twitter account. Shortly before he died a year ago today, I asked Cardinal Pell whether he and other members of the College of Cardinals had previously appealed to Pope Francis to change direction and uphold doctrine and apostolic tradition. Two words, he replied, many times. That is really interesting. I thought that was very interesting and kind of sad because uh, it proves, it demonstrates for me anyway, that um, Pope Francis has, you know, that... From a magisterial point of view, you know, um, it's important to understand that the magisterium is the Pope and the bishops. It, like in modern terminology, anyway, it tends to be talking about um, the um, hierarchy of the church and their teaching authority. Uh, so it's important, you can imagine, that the Pope is in. It's not just going off on his own direction. So there are lots of uh, very careful things that have to surround the magisterium for it, in order for it to be authentic. Um, and part of that is that it's in you know, continuity with scripture, obviously is the main, the most, it can't contradict scripture at all. Um, and tradition, what's always been taught. So it can't contradict what's gone before. Um, and it has to be the Pope teaching along with the bishops. So, for example, those who are claiming that fiducia supplicans, the recent declaration from the Vatican about the blessing of same-sex couples, is magisterial. I mean, you could probably argue to some sense it is magisterial in that it comes from a member of the hierarchy. Um, but the fact that most of the bishops aren't in continuity, you know, have sort of spoken out against it, really puts into question whether or not it is authentic magisterium. So that, you know, that's a really good point there, that if Cardinal Pell is saying that cardinals and bishops are going to him and saying, look, you're heading in the wrong direction here, Holy Father, um, that really does seriously call into question the magisterial authority. Um, some other stuff we've got going on here is, this is what I mentioned, I'm going to try and um, write something perhaps for the Catholic Herald on this, um, this bizarre statement that Pope Francis has said that um, Pope, that Mar Marxists and Christians have a common mission and the Catholic Church has always stood against all kinds of collectivism. Uh, so, you know, what? <laughs> and this is part of this group um, that he set up himself. He set up this group of dialogue between Christians and um, Marxists and what's interesting about it is that if you remember that he's from South America, Latin America, where you saw this rise of liberation theology, which is, again, has been heavily criticized by the church because it is introduces collectivism, it introduces flavors of socialism and Marxism into um, and it with this care of the poor sort of narrative. Um, so it's it's, a, you know, a big error. And uh, it's obviously something that coming from Latin America, Pope Francis is the most sympathetic. I mean, it doesn't necessarily follow that he would be sympathetic, but um, he seems to be sympathetic. And that's been noted as well. Um, 
So that's that story. We've got this one as well here that the Bishops' Conferences of Africa and Madagascar have issued a statement firmly rejecting the blessing of same-sex couples, which the DDF de declaration. And it really is quite a strong statement from those bishops. Um, so, you know, this all ties into what I'm going to talk to you about uh, now, really. So uh, very, in, but like you can see, it's a busy old day. Um, lots going on. And um, I think the best way, of, well, the most interesting thing for me that I'm going to go through with you this evening, this, this evening for me, it might be morning for you guys, depending on when you're picking in, is just this uh, report from Ed Condon in The Pillar about Pope Francis's new head of the Dicastria of the Doctrine of Faith, his old buddy from Argentina, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez. So um, this is a great article that has a you know gives us a serious look at Fernandez. Um, and I, one of the things I find interesting about Fernandez is that he everything we know about him is through his relationship with Pope Francis. Um, Pope Francis, his, his relationship with Pope Francis dates back to the the work that he did with the Argentine Bishops' Conference, where he demonstrated his ability to incorporate like these different viewpoints in, in drafting group statements. Um, he was head of the drafting committee for the Abparaseda Conference of CELAM in 2007, which is this, you know, I've done a, another video on that, I think. Francis relied on Fernandez's skill to sort of do this synthesis thing. The resistance on the part of the Roman Curia, the Roman Curia were resistant to um, Fernandez's selection as rector of the of the university that Pope Francis wanted him to be the rector of is one of the thing one of the elements that's supposed to have solidified Pope Francis's support um, and prompted his name in Fernandez as an archbishop and given him appointment appointment assignments. So you know you can see as an archbishop, Pope Francis was sort of um, in opposition a lot of the time to the Curia, and that hasn't changed. I don't think he still is in opposition uh, to the Holy See. So, so let's have a little look through this document here. Um, I don't know if you want me to give you some of the details about Fernandez himself. He was Archbishop of La Plata. Um, he was born in 1962, so um, in, the, in the Cordova, Cordoba province of Argentina. Um, his father, Emilio, was a shopkeeper who supported um, Raul Alfonsin, who was the radical political leader at the time. Um, Fernandez entered the seminary in 1978. So you can see he's quite young when he entered seminary. Now, I don't, I haven't been able, like a lot of these Argentinians, I haven't been able to find out a lot about him. Um, it wasn't until the late 1990s, so there's quite a long gap there, that he uh, sort of made had this relationship all of a sudden with with Jorge Bergoglio. Um, he declined an invitation to head the Theological Institute in Bogota as a result of um, Pope Francis, now Pope Francis, then the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Jorge Bergoglio's um, advice. So he headed this CUA, which is the Pontifical Catholic University of, of Argentina, um, where he headed, so he, he headed the Faculty of Theology there, and when, when then Cardinal Bergoglio nominated him to serve as its rector in 2009. So all his power has come from, from Jorge Bergoglio. Um, he took his oath of office on the 20th of May 2011, um, but he was then um, all sort of automatically in trouble with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And Cardinal Muller, who headed the CDF from 2012 to 2017, has actually confirmed that the CDF had maintained a file on Fernandez in the late 2000s due to concerns about his theology. Well, and that, all of that has come, you know, to the fore, hasn't it now? So, OK, so this article says that Taking over the role in September, the Pope's pick for the doctrinal department started by being effectively sidelined from half the dicastery's remit 
after the Pope excused him, some would say excluded him from playing a part in its handling of clerical sexual abuse cases. Since then, Fernandez has had to weather repeated questions about his suitability for the role in light of his previous writings and overseen the highly contentious rollout of a declaration on blessings for couples in, in same-sex or irregular relationships. So this um, limitation thing, that was that's basically to avoid the fact that he was accused, um, I don't want to say definitely he did, but I think, it, I think it's really clear they definitely did cover up quite a lot of sexual abuse cover-up going on um, when he was Bishop <laughs> of La Plata. So this seems like a cynical political move to avoid him getting into trouble for that, Viv, that the Pope basically said that he would exclude him from, from having anything to do with that part of it. While rumours of the Cardinal offering Pope Francis's resignation are almost certainly overblown, Fernandez has become a lightning rod for criticism and controversy, drawing often unwelcome and attention to a department which has kept a lower profile under the current Pope which when he appointed him, the Pope wrote this really like sort of critical letter of the, of the department of the, like what they're now called in the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, um, which was, seemed a bit weird, but he's obviously, he doesn't like the, the CDF or the DDF. Um, and so he wants this guy in there because he thinks he's going to manipulate things. At the same time, many of the Cardinal's strongest critics and fiercest defenders share a common assessment that Fernandez is doing what Francis intended with the role, pushing boundaries and leading a bold, even radical push to embed the Pope's pastoral vision into the church's teaching. Well, um, you know, it's not working very well, is it? I mean, if that is the strategy, it's a, a dreadful strategy. And you have to wonder, with this papacy, what, what element of Francis's papacy is succeeding. Is it the China deal? Um, is it Amoris Laetitia? Is it is environmental policy? Because um, to me, it all just looks like an absolute disaster. It doesn't look like he's done anything. Is it Traditiones Custodes? Is you know that? I mean, what's his legacy going to be? It's going to be chaos, confusion, and just infighting in the church. Surely, surely bishops and priests can see that this is the case. But what was Pope Francis wanted? But what was that? But was that what Pope Francis wanted? Sorry, when he named Fernandez to the role? Not necessarily. And this is the important bit, according to some working in the Vatican and in the papal orbit. So the pillars, obviously, as I explained, if you watched my last video, the pillars got some real inside information. So it's worth listening to what they've got to say here. Indeed, as some tell it, Fernandez wasn't the Pope's preference for the job at all, and his appointment was a gamble which some say doesn't appear to be paid off. <laughs> you could say that again, couldn't you? It's an absolute shower, isn't it? It's a complete circus. I don't know about not paying off. Okay, when the Arch when the then Archbishop Fernandez was announced as the incoming prefect for the DDF last summer, many Vatican commentators hailed the selection as bold. And in some ways, obvi an obvious choice by Pope Francis. Well, who were they? It could only have been Austin Ivory and Mike Lewis at where Peter is. Who else was saying that? A fellow, well, I suppose, like you've got um, the fish wrap, the National Catholic Distorter, probably had something to say about it as well, and America Magazine, or for all things Jesuit. <laughs> so um, it's just getting, like, the you know, the Catholic media is just so polarised over all this stuff as well. And it's all just part of the legacy of what a Pope, who is supposed to bring unity to the church, as this Pope has done. He's just upset and alienated everyone. A fellow Argentine friend, a long-time collaborator of Francis, Tucho, as he's known to friends, I think that means tube in Spanish, which is really sort of a weird thing to be called as a nickname, isn't it? Um, he seemed to be a natural fit to cement the Pope's curial overhaul at the DDF, after the promulgation of the Apostolic Constitution, Pre Decarte Evangelium. Okay, I could go into that, but I don't know, it, you might find it a little bit boring. Um, it is, 
it's you know one of those documents that um, Pope Francis promulgated basically as part of his attempt to um, change things. It's like you know it's got all the nice words in it, but uh, ultimately it's just something that he did in order to uh, swap things about a bit. Um, as the often so this is two shows is the often credited ghostwriter of some of the Pope's most talked about texts, including the most controversially received passages of Amoris Laetitia. Some church watchers confidently claim that Fernandez had always been in the papal mind as the man to convert the DDF from doctrinaire thought police. When was it ever doctrinaire thought police? Not for about 300 years, I don't think. Into a forward thinking pastoral think tank. What a load of absolute cobblers that is. It, what he has transformed it into is a complete circus, isn't he? I'm trying not, I'm very trying to use moderate language, so please bear with me. Um, but that sense of inevitably around Fernandez's appointment, inevitability around Fernandez's appointment, overlooked previous adamant predictions of the role was going elsewhere. Okay, so this is interesting as well, and I'd kind of forgotten about this. So, um, in December 2022, the Vatican rumor mill went into overdrive that Francis was poised to name German Germany's Heim, Bishop Heimer Wilmer to lead the DDF. In a pattern that has repeated itself more than once during the Francis pontificate, Vatican blogs broke news of the plan, which met with furious criticism from some quarters before being defended by staunch supporters of the Pope. Only then to never materialise, right? So, so a pattern that has repeated itself more than once. So what, what he's saying here is that it's like the Pope floats these ideas in it, like this is really the way politicians do things in the UK. I'm sure that it's the same thing in other countries as well, but they'll put out rumours and see what kind of reaction it gets and then they'll tailor their reaction based on that response. So um, it's a very sort of, you know, you might say a shrewd political move, but it's not really what we want to be seeing from the Pope um, because the Pope shouldn't really be, you know, swayed by the whim of everyday people is, you know, like by, um, it shouldn't be about popularity is what I'm saying. It shouldn't be a form of popularism. It should be about what's the most, uh, what's the best way or the best appointment to forward the mission of the church. That makes sense, doesn't it? So, you know, why is he floating these ideas? Um, in between, Wilma's supposedly pending appointment was reported widely and without enough confidence that senior cardinals, including the then incumbent prefect, Cardinal Louis Ladaria Ferra SJ, were said to have raised concerns with the Pope personally, according to Vatican sources. After the non-event of Wilmer's non-appointment, some Vatican watchers claimed that a furious backlash from a critical mass, the College of Cardinals, had scared Francis off his decision. Others argued that Wilmer was never a serious contender for the job at all, but that Francis had cannily used his name to draw fire and make his eventual actual preference for Fernandez see, appear less controversial. Well, I don't really believe that, but I do think that the first thing there is, is plausible. And actually, I did report on that myself. Um, so just flicking over to my blog here, this is a post that I made on the 27th of December 2022, Cardinal's revolt against Pope Francis' DDF appointment. Just before Christmas, rumours abound that Pope Francis was about to appoint a German radical to the head of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith. Cardinal Lardaria, the pre prefect for the Congregation of, uh, for the Doctrine of the Faith, has been in the post since the summer of 2017 when Pope Francis removed Cardinal Gerhard Muller, the former Bishop of Regensburg, mandates, and a guy with a double doctorate in theology and, and divinity. So, you know, this was he was the expert, really. Mandates at the Roman Curia are for five years. Lardaria's term expired on July the 1st, 2022, and it was not renewed. So it was clear that Francis was looking for a successor. Reliable voices from the Vatican stated that it was certain that Lardaria's successor would be the German bishop, Heiner Wilmer of Hild Hildesheim. 
Bishop Wilmer is also firmly within the consensus of the German Episcopate that the radical reinvention of Catholicism being proposed by the German Synodal Way is necessary. Okay, so do you remember right at the beginning, one of the first things the Pope did was started pushing um, Cardinal Walter Casper's stuff about you know, communion for the divorce and remarried, and then that came out. So there's a there's a continual German influence in everything that the Pope seems to be doing, which is ironic because obviously he he seems to have betrayed Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So there's a real thread that well, we've got to try and keep all these things in our mind when we're thinking about what's going on here. Um, writing in Catholic World Report, George Weigel stated that such an appointment would seem papal repudiation for the man Francis previously appointed as prefect for the then Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, fellow Jesuit Cardinal Lardaria. This is because, in his address to the German bishops gathered in Rome in late November, Cardinal Lardaria offered a calm but devastating theological critique of the German synodal path that Bishop Vilmer so fervently supports, and with and which he in fact embodies. In that address, the Cardinal reminded German Catholicism that it is part of a universal church that has settled teachings on the goods of human love and its expression, a church that must reject gender ideologies incompatible with the biblical word of God, a church that is governed by bishops by the will of Christ, a church that is determined that it has no authority to admit women to holy orders, and a church that reads the signs of the times, not through opinion polling through among ill-catechized Catholics, but through the lens of ancient timeless and irreformable convictions grounded in revelation. That was wonderful from La Daria, wasn't it? And and th- I wrote an article for this in the Catholic Herald. Um, Cardinal Ule also, th- he did a double-pronged thing. But you see this pattern where it's like Pope Francis ap- appoints these people to be in these positions. And when they disagree with his sort of radical, progressive agenda, he just ditches them and he gets someone else in. So anyway... As we've said, Wilma didn't uh, materialise, thank goodness. But instead, we got um, we got good old Tucho. So <laughs> um, let's go back to that pillar article and and see what we can glean from the rest of it. Here we go. Okay. Absent and unburdening of the papal mind, we will probably never know how close Wilma came to being the Pope's actual choice to lead the DDF. But, I mean, to me, it seems really likely because everything was coming out of the Vatican that this was a done deal. So, um, you know, it was interesting. And this is a pattern, like we said, that we've heard loads of times before. The idea that this candidacy was floated to clear the way for Fernandez seems implausible. Francis does not have the reputation of a Pope who cares much about upsetting so-called conservative opinion once he's made up his mind. I completely agree with that. But some senior figures close to the appointment process have told the pillar that Francis was sincerely open to the idea of naming Wilmer and was convinced against the idea by the weight of the negative feedback he received. So, and this was like the same in the Amazonian Synod. It did seem like the Pope rode back from some of his more radical choices because of the amount of backlash. So he is taking the temperature. The Pope did not, which is another reason why I say, you know, recognise and resist. That's really the message of what, you know, that I'm trying to put out here. Let's analyse what's going on, honestly, um, with uh, the best intentions, you know, and with the, the, we want to be in communion with the Pope. But honestly, and if we, you know, if we, if it's hard to reconcile, then we have to call it out and say, this isn't magisterial, you know, this isn't in keeping with tradition uh, and sacred scripture. The Pope did not want to cause a fight with any appointment, said a senior curial official close to the DDF. He has a vision for how he wishes to see the dicastery work, but it does not involve creating conflict. I mean... He's not doing very well if that's what he's trying to do, is he? The same source told the pillar that Francis is concerned to see his style and pastoral and vision of pastoral care received received across the church, but that his goal would be best served through sensitive presentation, which did not create or exacerbate the vision. I can't believe that, can you? I just find that impossibly difficult to believe that that is honestly what he's about. 
Um, I think what he's about is putting, he's pushing things. He pushes it, he pushes it. When he gets a load of kickback, he re, he sort of reverts into some sort of semi-orthodoxy or he says something about the devil or about surrogacy or something. Um, and then what he does is he changes the personnel around. He finally puts someone in. And what I love about this is that Fernandez is a step too far. You know, Lardaria, I was really nervous because he's a Jesuit and, you know, um, he, and they took Muller out and put him in. So I thought, well, Pope Francis obviously wants him in because he's the, you know, but the fact that he was Muller's secretary for so long made, and he'd worked with Muller made give me some confidence that he wasn't going to be a complete disaster. And that's how it turned out. In the end, we had this intervention with the Germans where he really said some brilliant things, you know. So that put my that my, that made me think. And if you read my article, perhaps I'll put I'll post it on here. Um, I, like it really gave me hope because I thought, well, thank God there are men, you know, in in Rome in charge of these dicasteries who are faithful to Jesus and faithful to the gospel and faithful to the. And that's all I want. That's all I'm interested in from the men who represent my faith. And because my faith is about being faithful, faithful is faith to Jesus and to the gospel. And what I'm trying to do is I think that there are very much two camps in that you could broadly separate it into two camps. And one camp is that one camp think that the church is wrong and it needs to change and get with the times because um, the secular zeitgeist is correct. And we what we need to do is get in step and the church needs to update its ideas cardinal hollerick is a great example he said that you know in light of social developments church teaching on homosexuality homosexuality is wrong he actually said that the pope made him uh, put him in charge of the synod on synodality so the pope must have liked what he said there um this really worries me because it's a, an incredible amount of hubris we haven't got to this position um, by making up new stuff. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, theological giants, um, the saints, um, great popes, bishops, holy men and women. And we need to have some respect for that, for the democracy of the dead. We need to have some respect for um, our position in the church and that we are servants of the gospel. We're, it's not our job to make up new stuff. It's our job to be an echo of the deposit of faith. The, the message of Jesus and the apostles. So one side of the church seemed to be desperate to twist and change the agenda. And the other side of the church, the side of the church that I, I firmly belong to, and there are loads of us out there, you know, we are listening carefully to the words of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We are pondering the gospel in our hearts and we are listening to divine revelation because we know that that Divine revelation has got the power to change us. In, in the Greek word metanoia, you know, the first thing that Jesus calls us to in the gospel is change. So the power of the gospel is to recognize that we need to change, that all of us need to change because we're wounded by concupiscence, by our by sin. Um, and in order we can't free ourselves from that sin on our own. We need grace. We need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in order to rescue us from the slavery of sin. That is the gospel message. That is the power of the gospel, not this therapeutic ontology that um, these guys are pushing now, uh, which is something to do with, you know, it's like you can't ever be healed of that wound. So you just have to put up with it. And um, that's false. That's a false gospel. As St. Paul says in the Galatians, you know, reject it. So this is what worries me that there are there, that there seem to be broadly two two camps in the church, and all of these guys seem to be in the first camp, the camp that wants to change revelation really, and and aren't interested in pondering the gospels or with humility, um, which Pope Benedict embodied for me, that he was still inspired and invigorated by the gospels to the point where he could give us the face of our Lord Jesus Christ in three volumes in, in Jesus of Nazareth in such beautiful prose. You know, it was such a beautiful work. Um, and that that's his legacy. What's Francis' legacy going to be? China? God help us. What an absolute nightmare. Right, okay. Let's go back to this 
document. Let's go back to this pillar article, which is really, really good and interesting, I think. Um, so yeah, he doesn't want to, he does not involve creating conflict. <laughs> well, if that is his modus operandi, then he don't know what he's doing. He's pretty rubbish at it, isn't he? The same source told the pillar that Francis is concerned to see his style and vision of pastoral care received across the church, but his goal was to do a sensitive presentation which did not exacerbate the vision, which failed at that utterly, isn't he? With that in mind, sources told the pillar, while Fernandez was an obvious candidate in that he is attuned to the Pope's thinking and priorities, he was not Francis's first or only choice for the DDF prefect, and that, far from courting controversy, the Pope had actually preferred someone who could be, act as a steady force in the doctrinal office. Now, this is interesting, because we've all assumed that because Tucho is his buddy from Argentina, he couldn't wait to get him in, especially because he wrote Amoris Letizia. So this is the guy who's going to do all the casuistry. He's going to do all the sophistry. He can do all the fancy talking and all the, that Pope Francis thinks is the thing that com that convinces people. You know, I, I'm not convinced by any of the talk, any of it from the beginning of this papacy. I can smell it a mile off. But, you know, obviously the Pope thinks that's what works. So, and then the pillar says, in fact, Pope Francis was convinced that the right man for the role was Cardinal Joseph Tobin of, New of Newark. One senior source at the Secretariat told the pillar, Tobin, you know who Tobin is? <laughs> I'm sure you do, but basically, um, Tobin is famous, what is most famous for, I suppose, is this tweet that he, he posted from an aeroplane where he said supposed to be airborne in 10 minutes nighty night baby i love you and he also was having he had this uh have i got another thing here of it um he, like this guy look he keeps coming up with him this italian actor this uh italian actor who was living in tobin's apartment um so the the chat um this is the guy that Tobin was sending that tweet to. This is uh, Bree Doyle, who's a, a Vatican a, Rome, a Vatican journalist from from um, Rome. Cardinal Joseph Tobin, notoriously known for having kept an Italian actor, Francesco Castiglione, in his New Jersey chancery, along with tweeting out, Nighty Night Baby, supposedly to his sister, has just been given a position overseeing education. Member of the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith. So, anyway, this is not a reliable. This guy is a redemptorist. Um, he's not a reliable. <laughs> he's not a reliable person at all. Um, this is an article by Phil Lawlow, who's a, a journalist I really respect in Catholic culture. Let's suppose a man you know accidentally makes public a Twitter message that was obviously supposed to be read by only one person. The message reads, Nighty night, baby, I love you. The man who sent that message is not married. What do you conclude? Right. Now, further suppose that that man in question is a celibate priest. In fact, a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Does that alter your conclusion? Right. After Cardinal Joseph Tobin of Newark sent an infamous Twitter message in 2018, and after the McCarrick scandal broke, Rod Dreyer observed in the American Conservative at one point, giving men like Tobin the benefit of the doubt might have seemed defensible, not after McCarrick. Right. Oddly, Rod later seemed to ignore his own device and displayed at least some measure of willingness to accept the Cardinal's unlikely explanation for his accidental message. In fairness, it is possible that Cardinal Tobin was telling the truth about mistakenly direct messaging his sister on Twitter. Yes, it's possible, but is it probable? A friend of mine, a priest who did not pull his punches, was so not so willing to credit the innocent explanation. In fact, my friend, who sadly died suddenly last year, found it suddenly found it difficult to understand why other prelates quietly accepted the cardinal story. He wrote, All the other calls for investigative commissions and policies and forced resignations of Whirl and McCarrick missed the point. As long as Nighty Night Baby is kept on his feet by his brother bishops, they are all still playing Let's Pretend. They have no true concern for the souls of their brethren, nor a fortiori for those who, whom their brethren are pastors. The problem is not now, how can we keep bishops from committing crimes? A branch of the military service in need of techniques 
to keep its members from criminally punishing punishable treason would have ipso facto lost its reason for existence. But Tobin has announced to the world, by accident, true, that he currently has a lover, that he refuses to repent and turn from his state of sin, shown by the preposterous lie offered in lieu of true explanation, and is, in fact, defying his brothers to call his bluff, which, if they thought elementary sexual continence a necessary condition of priestly ministry, they would have done, and which they can do at any moment. No papal action necessary, no petitions or open letters, no committees or canonical trials, just a couple man-to-man phone calls with a promise to make the substance of the call public unless Tobin did so first. As long as Tobin is a mitre, nothing whatsoever will have changed. And I think that is absolutely right. So, But we know that Pope Francis does love to get some you know, broken people involved in his work, doesn't he? And one of the theories for this is that um, he knows their sins, he knows the dirt, and that they owe everything then to him, and that he can get, you know, he can sort of hold up the the dirty stuff over them, and you know, it's mafiosa stuff, isn't it? Okay, so that's extraordinary that he thought Tobin would be a good break, and Lord preserve us from that. Um, instead, he's got this clown too, Jolin. The official, with knowledge of the Pope's apparent preference, said that Tobin was preferred because of his record as a prelate who could speak sensitive personal blah, blah, blah. Not that, nothing to do with the fact that he's a complete liability then. Um, but the senior official said Francis in the end decided to against appointing Tobin to the DDF because he preferred to keep him as a senior figure in the United States. So, you know, making a mess in the United States Bishops Conference, basically. The Pope said it should be Tobin. I know it should. But he said he needs him in America. The same source said Tobin's continued voice in the US Bishops' Conference was one consideration, but the Pope was primarily concerned with the Cardinal being available to move the Archdiocese of Washington in the medium term. The current Archbishop in the American capital, Cardinal Wilton Gregory, is 76, another dodgy Cardinal. Cardinal Fernandez was not the Pope's final preference, but he chose him because without Tobin, he could work with Fernandez well, as they have. Well, that's gone well, is not it? <laughs> they have other issues uh, and other issues could be resolved. The same source pointed to Fernandez sidelining from the DDF's clerical abuse caseload as a matter of preempting criticism for the Cardinal's handling of cases in the Archdiocese of La Plata. Has it? Has, it, has that worked? <laughs> what a load of rubbish. The first thing everyone did was criticise him for his handling of abuse caseload in the Archdiocese of La Plata. It was the first thing that happened. Why are you appointing this bloke to the head of the, the DDF when he has been he's compromised on abuse? So before he'd even started, he, you know, his his reputation was mud. The Holy Father does not want a mess on abuse cases in brackets because he's you know famously he said let like make a mess didn't he to world youth day and he does not want to create accusations of making a mess i can't i mean that is the most ironic i mean that guy what well, uh, i hope if he spoke to Ed Condon told him said to him what are you on about are you drunk because the holy father is on record saying that he does want to make a mess but if Fernandez's selection to lead the DDF was something of a calculated bet, offsetting the benefits of his closeness to the Pope's thinking against his potential liabilities, of which there are many, it increasingly appears to have been a miscalculation, like everything else in this papacy. The issuing of the pre-Christmas decree for Aducia supplicants caused instant divisions and globe instant and global divisions to among to open among the College of Bishops, and now he's lost Africa. Today he's lost Africa. All of Africa has said no. With entire conferences and even continents appearing to reject both its theological premises and its application outright, while others immediately sought to apply the document beyond its own stated limits. Fernandez was forced to undertake at first a lightning round of explanatory interviews to try and calm the controversy before issuing a five-page press release. That is, a member in Fiducia Supplicants, number 41, he says he, he, no more will be said about it. 
and then he immediately had to issue a five-page press release seeking to offer the kind of detailed interpretive guidance of the text he'd previously said would not be forthcoming. What an absolute joke. In Rome itself, fiducia supplicants has also caused problems. This is good. Anything that causes problems for Cardinal Arthur Roche can't be a bad thing. Cardinal Arthur Roche, former Bishop of Leeds and Prefect for the Dicastery for the Divine Worship, is said to have complained that his department was not consulted on the text, its publication, or how it is to be applied, and that widely reported examples of priests appearing to bless same-sex unions who could have predicted that would happen, have created a headache for his department. God love poor Cardinal Arthur Roche, because um, he hasn't caused any tra any trouble at all, has he? Now, this is uh, the brilliant Larry Chap in Catholic World Report. Just to clarify this point about why, why is there this problem with liturgy? Um, so the problem is that, the, that Fiducia Supplicants attempts to... Um, set up a false dichotomy between blessings at like formal liturgical and or like non-liturgical and non-sacramental and all this stuff so larry chap's got a brilliant bit here about it and it says unfortunately the document is just the latest in a line of confusing text doctors was already in an already confusing papacy it's not just me guys all right he's a professor <laughs> why is this document needed at all the innovation of a posting of positing a distinction between types of priestly blessings, which makes some of them non-liturgical and non-sacramental, is problematic. Problematic is bonkers, is what it is. The text apparently presumes that such a distinction is possible, but it flies in the face of the fact that when a priest blesses anything or anyone in any setting of any kind, he is doing so not as an individual who possesses some kind of personal powers of magic, but precisely in persona Christi and in the name of the whole church, which possesses the full agency of Christ as he who blesses the world. Therefore, all priestly blessings have an inherent orientation to the liturgical and sacramental life of the church. Indeed, it is not why people want a priest to bless them, their houses and their devotional objects in the first place. I could ask any random layperson to bless those things in the name of Christ Jesus but we seek out instead priests to make such blessings because of his sacramental character as one possessing holy orders, which in turn is what links him to Christ and all of the other sacraments in a preeminent way. In other words, we seek out priestly blessings because we rightly sense the full weight of the church in all of her sacramental glory behind those blessings. Thus, all priestly blessings are inherently sacramental and liturgical in a real way. So doesn't that make, that's, that clears it up perfectly, doesn't it? So you can see what a headache, how um, Fernandez has idiotically bumbled into this liturgical um, minefield and poor old Arthur Roosh, uh, Uncle Arthur as we call him in England, he's, uh, he's not best pleased. Um, so I feel terribly sorry for him. Not. To make matters worse for Fernandez, his ability to bring his... <laughs> this is funny, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, you've got to laugh, honestly. To make matters worse for Fernandez, his ability... It's like, you know, you get... like It's like, you know, um, say you run a big multinational company and you, you meet this bloke down the pub and you really, really like him and, you, and he's a bit down on his luck. So you think, I know... I'll make you CEO or managing director of the big company that I own. And the bloke comes in, he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, as we say in England, he doesn't know his ass from his elbow. And he ends up just going around cocking everything up. That is exactly what Fernandez has done here, isn't it? And he's only been in the job a few weeks. It, I don't know what else. It's like he's going around setting light to everything. It's absolutely hilarious. Oh, to make matters, oh, this is the book. So I haven't done a video on the book or I haven't written anything about it because, you know, I wouldn't I don't I wouldn't recommend you read it because you don't need to. I haven't read it. I've you know, I liked what Taylor Marshall wrote about it, um, said about it on his video where I mean he did you know, I thought he was quite good the way that he, he did it and he was saying um that particularly that one interesting thing was that 
you know, this link between Rupnik because he's there's this sex magic thing. Gavin, you know, I'm, so if you don't know, I'm one third of Catholic Unscripted. We've got an apostolate, um, Catherine Bennett, Gavin, Dr. Gavin Ashenden, and myself. Um, you can find our channel, Catholic Unscripted. I'll link to it below. Um, you can become a member and support our work, but we all write for the Catholic Herald. Um, Gavin's written something really good today about this, so I'll link to that below as well. Um, but there, but like you've got Rupnik, who's doing, you know, there's a lot, it rings a lot of bells if you have I've written about what Rupnik was up to. And um, now you've got Fernandez, he's got this old book and it's all the same sort of stuff. So his ability to bring his first big project under controls was further hampered by the resurfacing of a 1998 book that he wrote while still a priest. Now, I mean, 1998, all right, I know it's over 20 years ago, but it doesn't seem that long ago to me. I'm sort of 50-odd. Um, you know, it doesn't seem that long ago. So anyway, um, that's probably because I'm old. But that text, Mystical Passion, an often graphic meditation on sexuality and spirituality, has again forced the Cardinal to distance himself from his own previous work, saying publicly that he, he would not write such a thing now and he did not support its continued circulation. Now, he tried to burn every copy that he could get his mitts on, let me tell you. He did his absolute best to cover that up. Apart from criticisms of the text itself, the book also raised a new raised new questions about Fernandez's suitability for his role as prefect, since in it, some parts question the culpable sinfulness of extramarital sex acts, and in others, advances a problematic sexualization of spirituality. So that's this weirdo sex magic-y thing that is on about but you can see the extramarital sexual acts and all of this stuff it's deeply problematic for someone who's in in charge of doctrine isn't it you know as fernandez faces significant personal headwinds the more pressing concern for pope francis may be what his ddf prefect serial crisis means for his own legacy at 87 yes at 87 i mean what legacy in honesty what what is going to be pope francis's legacy at 87, Pope Francis is by any reasonable explanation into the later years of his pontificate. If his primary concern in naming a DDF prefect was to cement his theological vision, ensuring that it will outlast his own time in office, Fernandez may be on course to affect the opposite. <laughs> I mean, it was obvious. Anyway, who am I? What do I know? More than any other Pope, Francis has diversified the College of Cardinals preferring to name prelates from what he calls the global peripheries. Ironic, but like he hasn't allowed them to meet either. So he, so none of them know each other. I don't think, you know, like a lot of people talk about him packing the, the College of Cardinals to ensure Francis too, but I don't think that's the case. And Cardinal Pell of happy memory, God rest his soul, he um, said before he died that he had been in making it his personal work to get in touch with every one of those cardinals and let them know what a disaster Pope Francis was. So, ironically, though, it is in many of the peripheral regions, especially Africa, that opposition to fiducia supplicants has been most keenly expressed, along with criticism of Fernandez. So, again, if he has tried to diversify the College of Cardinals, it, it's another failed mission from Pope Francis, another failed project, isn't it? Um, far from bedding in Francis' legacy, his increasingly scandal-prone DDF prefect may end up creating a backlash to it. In that event, it becomes a question of how long Francis will be willing to keep him in an o even a long-time friend and collaborator in office. Well, the longer he keeps him in office, the more ridiculous the whole charade gets, really, doesn't it? And the more damage it does, it seems to me, the more... Um, damage it does to Pope Francis's legacy and um, to his reputation. So very interesting. Lot, like, lots of interesting little tidbits there, weren't there? The Wilmer connection, the Tobin connection. Uh, these are things coming out of the Vatican. So, And I think going through it again allows you to make those connections to things that have happened a few years back. And there are so many things now, it's hard to remember everything. So um, great journalism, again, by the pillar, I think. I'll pop all those links in the show notes. I've also got this buy me a coffee thing. If you're fed up with the bad lighting and the bad camera and all that sort of thing, you can chuck in a few quid and I'll buy one of them Sony blogging cameras so you can see my beautiful visage in all its glory <laughs> if you're that desperate. 
But seriously, I haven't got a lot of money, um, so anything you can chip in would help. Please do. Um, some of my friends, Anthony, who watches my videos from um, Avoiding Babylon, thanks, Anthony, had me on the show. Um, he's very, very cross that I get thousands and thousands of views and no subscribers. So please do like and subscribe. Um, I'd really appreciate your support in that regard. Like I say, Catholic Unscripted is the main show. So get over to Catholic Unscripted and sign up there and you can watch Gavin and Catherine and I talking about all this stuff. We're going to have another episode out very, very soon where we talk about all this. And we also look at um, the faith um, beauty, the beautiful aspects of the faith and, and why it's important to be a Catholic. So stay Catholic. Perhaps we just say a quick prayer for the Holy Souls and especially for Cardinal Pell on this uh, anniversary of his death. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. May perpetual light shine upon them. With the mercy of God, Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I had a bit of a laugh in the end. I hope you did too. God bless, and I'll see you on the next video.